This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Look, everybody loves cereal. Cereal is great. If you don't like cereal, you're a bit of a weirdo. You think this is fun? But the thing is, cereal doesn't always like you. Look, it's not going to be brilliant. You go to the supermarket, you see all the sugary cereals, and I, like, oh, yeah, I mean, when I was like eight, I could have 17 bowls of said cereal and then run around the playground for 20 minutes and burn off those 11,000 calories. But as an adult, you just don't have that luxury because you're like, oh, if I eat 11 bowls of cereal. <laughs> Well, I'm just gonna get quite fat, aren't I? Aren't I? So I didn't have cereal for a very long time, but then Magic Spoon came along and they were like, Simon, guess what? We've invented a cereal. It doesn't have any sugar in it. Amazing. And it's not just that. If you take a look at the box right here, or right here, yes, there are multiple different flavors. Chocolate, peanut butter down there. I've got fruity and sugar, or frosted, I think they call it. It's just, you know, regular, regular. I mean, it doesn't contain sugar, so I guess that's why they call it frosted. But it's like, you know, sugary cereal that you're used to as a kid. Zero grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs, 14 grams of protein. And by the way, also, it says on the side here, 140 calories per serving, which is excellent. Look, the reality is I didn't go to university for diet stuff, so I don't know much about protein and carbs. But I do know protein good. Sugar less good. Now you might be thinking oh, it's going to taste rubbish because it's got no sugar in it. Well, that is not true. The peanut butter is my absolute favorite. The one I just ate was chocolate. Mix them together, peanut butter and chocolate. It's amazing. Anyway, click the link in the description below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash megaprojects and grab a variety pack and try it out. Use the code megaprojects. You're at $5 off. Magic Spoon has also got a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, they'll give you your money back. You cannot lose now today's video. Stretching out across Britain like life-giving arteries that are not blogged with cholesterol thanks to Magic Spoon. Not really. There are waterways that helped power the Industrial Revolution. Britain's canal system now stretches to 6,400 kilometers. That's 4,000 miles, which is just a little less than the distance from London to New York. And it can be found across the nation, though predominantly in England between London and the major northern cities. Also, people often go for holidays. I remember going for a holiday as a kid on one of these canals for like a week. You just drive this boat. And I must have been like 11 years old. I thought it was extremely cool to drive the boat, except on the last night it rained and we left one of the windows open and my bed was totally wet with water, which was awesome. Y'all ever just be like chilling in the rain? Nowadays, they are mainly used for recreation read in my mind, recreational purposes and chugging slowly along in a brightly painted canal boat, which has become a well-loved British tradition. And with a speed limit of 6.4 kilometers per hour, that's four miles per hour on British canals, we really do mean slowly. Yeah, I do remember that, the boat was well slow. <laughs> but these great ditches filled with water were constructed not with leisurely cruisers in mind, but to provide an efficient form of transportation that could support the booming industrial revolution. Without these canals, it would have been impossible to move such large amounts of goods around the country so quickly. And I know we joked about the speed limit, but back in the 18th century, there weren't very many alternatives. Now, these canals played a vital role in Britain's economy and certainly helped to mold the nation into what it was by the end of the 18th century. It was big. A global superpower with an empire stretching around the world, it brought goods and materials back to Britain where they could be distributed around the country via the canal system. And if you want to hear, learn more about that, Find out about all the stuff in the British Museum that was brought from around the world and put in one British Museum. We did a whole video on it. It's difficult to know where to start with canals. The idea of using waterways for irrigation stretches back over 6,000 years to Mesopotamia. They were also used in Egypt by the Indus Valley Civilization, dating back to roughly 2600 BC. The Grand Canal in China is considered the longest canal in the world, stretching up to 1,776 kilometers, that's 1,104 miles, and connects Beijing and Hangzhou, while also linking five of China's major rivers. The oldest part of this canal dates back to the 5th century, but it saw 
extensive renovations and additions over the centuries, with the final form not appearing until the early 17th century. The oldest known canal in Britain was built by our Latin overlords, the Romans, who constructed the Fosdyke Navigation, which runs between Lincoln and the River Trent at Torxey around 120 AD. The navigation is still in use today and totals 18.1 kilometers, that's 11.3 miles, with just a single lock. It's so cool that something from nearly 2,000 years ago is still being used. It was used extensively by the Danes and the Normans in the 12th century to transport rock to build Lincoln Cathedral, but by the early 18th century it had fallen into such a poor state that it could just no longer be used. The Exeter Ship Canal was built in the 1560s to connect the River X to the Exeter Quay in the city and predates most British canals built during the heady days of the Industrial Revolution by quite some time. The dramatic change that the Industrial Revolution brought completely transformed certain parts of the world, and the invention of machines that could do the work of 50 men in a fraction of the time forever changed industries. Suddenly, huge looms could pump out cotton and thread at speeds that were unheard of. Mighty steam engines appeared, initially used to pull water from tin mines, but they rapidly found their way into many different industries, from railway locomotives and ships to powering enormous machines in the many factories across the country. It's difficult to give specific dates because this was a lengthy process, but it's generally considered that the Industrial Revolution began around the mid-18th century. These were dramatic days when new inventions appeared regularly along with vastly different ways of thinking. Suddenly, everything was about coal instead of wood, and British cities saw huge increases in population as people flooded into the major urban centers looking for work. Economic conditions improved for most people, but that certainly didn't mean it was all smiles and rainbows. British cities, especially London, began to sag under the way of numbers, the filthy conditions, and the toxic pollution that often poured from the many factories. A few people made an exorbitant amount of money, and while the lives of the vast majority certainly improved, it was here that we see the first shoots of the barbaric working conditions that many endured, and that continued really until the idea of workers' rights began emerging in the mid-19th century. Opened in 1757 and eventually linking St. Helens to the River Mersey at Spike Island in Widnes, the Sankey Canal was the first canal of the Industrial Age and was built initially to ferry vast amounts of coal into Liverpool from the Haydock collieries. But its use quickly expanded. It became vital for the growth of the chemical industry in the town. Construction of such a project required an Act of Parliament, which passed in 1755, and work began shortly after. Considering the technological boom in other industries, construction of the canals was done the old-fashioned way. Lots of men with shovels and scoops who toiled in groups to cut away miles of trenches to create the canals. Sometimes horses were brought in and large earth scoops attached, but this was very, very much a human endeavor. Once the trench had been dug, the sides would be supported by wooden beams, while the work of actually making the canal watertight began. There was never one single way of doing this, especially in the early days, and often workers used whatever they could find in the local area. This sometimes included limestone, but it often just came down to everyday clay that would line the inside of the canal. To ensure that there were no air pockets or gaps in the clay, workers would bring in cows that could be walked up and down the trench to flatten the earth. It's got to be quite a sight, right? You got the industrial revolution going on over there and you got yeah what we're we using to flatten the clay cows okay okay it's a bit different isn't it the Sankey Canal was first used in 1757 and immediately began transporting goods up and down the waterway for a flat rate of 10d per tonne, which is 10 old pence, worth around £5 today. This canal not only laid the blueprint for how canals around Britain would be built, but also how they'd be run. Parliament had specifically blocked those who owned the canals from also owning the boats to prevent monopolization. The Sankey Canal was therefore built and run by the Sankey Brook Navigation Company, with a toll for anyone who wanted to use it. Later additions to the Sankey Canal included several extensions to other collieries or manufacturing sectors who were eager to get in on the lucrative act. This canal also holds the distinction of having the first canal locks in Britain, a device used when the land isn't flat and it can either raise or lower barges. There are now 1,569 different locks around Britain, with the Kennet and Avon Canal, perhaps the most impressive, with 29 locks, 16 in a straight line, that sees the canal rise 72.2 meters, that's 237 feet in just 3.2 kilometers, that's two miles. And if you're on a pleasure boat, I remember locks when I went on a holiday with my family. They take forever. <laughs> Doing like 16 of them in a row would be a right pain in the ass. You'd be like, can't we just go down the weir bits? 
At this point, and actually for some time to come, canal boats were pulled by horses that would walk on the towpath beside the canal. This doesn't exactly paint the image of a transportation superhighway, but with canal boats capable of carrying 30 tons, it was more than 10 times what a single horse and cart could carry beforehand. The Sankey Canal proved to be an instant success, and it didn't take long for others to follow suit. The next major canal project came courtesy of Francis Edgerton, 3rd Duke of Bridgewater, who owned several coal mines which supplied much of the North's rampant appetite. But the Duke had a few problems. At this point, his mines were still transporting coal, either by pack horse, a tediously slow venture, or by river, which was much better, as long as the river went exactly where you wanted it to go. And if you know anything about rivers, they don't work like that. He's second. <laughs> You know, any, you don't. <laughs> Anyone knows this. His second issue related to the constant flooding of his mines, thanks to the awkward geological makeup in the region, but the Duke had a plan that might solve both of his problems. His idea was to build an underground canal at Worsley, which would then lead into an above-ground canal that linked Worsley and Salford. Not only would this create the much-needed waterway towards the busy urban centre of Manchester, but the underground canal could also provide the water for the above-ground canal, which in theory would leave his mines nice and dry. This is ridiculously ambitious for the 18th century. Construction began in 1760 and was completed with remarkable speed when it opened in 1761. Okay, maybe it wasn't that ambitious, it was easily achievable apparently. This was a costly project with the initial stretch from Worsley to Manchester coming in at a hefty £168,000, which sounds entirely reasonable until you realise it's £26 million today. Which still sounds incredibly reasonable given how much governmental projects cost, but uh, obviously money worked different in the past. But within a year of its opening, so much coal was making its way to Manchester that its price had fallen by half. The 66 kilometres, that's 41 miles worth of canal, was hugely impressive, especially for the time, but it came with another groundbreaking piece of engineering that helped define British canals. Aqueducts had first been introduced to Britain by the Romans, though their routes go all the way back to the Assyrian Empire in the 9th century BC. However, none had ever been fully navigated by boat, until now that is. The Barton Aqueduct became the world's first navigable aqueduct when it opened on the 17th of July 1761, and it was described as one of the seven wonders of the Canal Age. Measuring 118 meters long, 11 meters wide, and 12 meters above the river at its highest point, the Barton Aqueduct was a colossus of the Industrial Age, and crowds would often gather to marvel as canal boats slowly made their way across it. It was built using coarse ashlar with brickwork used for the three arches, but very nearly it became an extremely high-profile disaster. Once it had been finished, water was slowly pumped across to fill it, and you can imagine the horror on the faces as one of the arches began to buckle. Work ceased, and the aqueduct was drained immediately. Repairs began, but it wasn't immediately clear whether the Barton Aqueduct could ever be used. However, the second time around, water flowed across and the three arches stood firm. This engineering marvel would go on to be used for more than a hundred years, before being demolished in 1893. <laughs> The two earliest projects had proven to be monstrously successful, and it wasn't long until canal mania began. In 1790, only one Act of Parliament was granted for a new canal, costing around £90,000 or £11 million today. But three years later, that figure had shot up to 20, with spending up to £2.8 million or $305 million today. This also coincided with a speculation frenzy when greater financial freedom and disposable income for some led to more and more people investing in the companies that were set to build these new canals. Dividends were paid out on the canal profits, and with business seemingly only going one way, it seemed crazy not to invest in this lucrative new business. The golden age of British canals had begun, and this was the period where most of the system that you see today was put in place. Most of the earliest examples appeared in Britain's industrial north, and London wasn't technically linked until 1801, when the Paddington arm of the Grand Union Canal opened. Gradually, vast arteries began stretching up and down the country, effectively linking large swaths of it. Construction was usually carried out by large armies of navvies, short for navigators, unskilled labourers who would often travel with projects. Huts were usually built to provide temporary accommodation for the navvies before everything was torn down and 
moved further along the canal. This was an era of countless breathtaking construction projects that completely changed the country. The Pontisolite Aqueduct in northeast Wales was opened in 1805 and remains the longest aqueduct in Britain at an impressive 307 meters, that's 336 yards. It's also the highest aqueduct in the world and reaches a total height of 38 meters, or 126 feet. The Stand Edge Tunnel near Huddersfield is still the longest and deepest canal tunnel in Britain at 5.1 kilometers in length and diving down 194 meters at its deepest point. In Scotland, the Union Canal was built between Falkirk and Edinburgh primarily to bring materials and coal into the capital, and it was opened in 1822, while the Caledonian Canal, linking the east coast of Inverness with the west coast at Core Park near Fort William, was a distance of 100 kilometers, and it opened that same year. The canal system had been more successful than anybody would have dreamt. By the 1820s, it was possible to move goods throughout the system and to access most areas of England, though Wales and Scotland received only a fraction, perhaps sometimes due to environmental factors, but no doubt also to underpin where, economically, the clout of Britain really lay. The canal industry was a thriving business, and a lot of people were making money, but a rival was about to emerge that would eventually decimate the industry. When Britain's first railway using steam locomotives opened in 1825 between Stockton and Darlington, it wasn't immediately clear what this would mean for the canals. Here were all of these nicely built waterways connecting major manufacturing areas, so were they about to be abandoned for something that would need to be specially built all around the country? Now, it's crazy to think it now, but a lot of people weren't entirely sold on the idea of railways when they first appeared, and certainly not for passenger use. However, when the Manchester to Liverpool line opened in 1830, carrying both freight and passenger passengers, public sentiment began to change. A new king had arrived. By the 1840s, railways began to take off, and the money that would have gone toward new canals was instead invested in the railways. It did make financial sense. The walking pace of a canal boat and a horse was no match for a steam locomotive with 10 or 20 carts. In a desperate bid to keep up, canal owners slashed their tolls, which of course badly affected the dividends. The golden period of enormous financial gain was well and truly over. But of course, it couldn't halt the slide, and by the 1850s, the canals had seen the amount of cargo hauled each year fall by nearly two-thirds. Canals managed to stagger through the 19th century, sometimes providing a cheap alternative or by targeting niches in the market that railways couldn't supply. Coal became the principal commodity, and probably only because the factories and mills in the north needed so much of it. Then the 20th century saw things become even worse as the introduction of the automobile completely changed the face of transportation. During the 1950s and 1960s, freight transport on the canals collapsed even further as goods began to be transported on lorries more and more. It's also worth noting at this point that while other European nations with canals, notably France, Holland, and Germany, had already invested heavily to modernize their own canals, often by widening and deepening them to allow for greater haulage, this was not the case in Britain, where the overwhelming majority of the canals remained more or less exactly as they had since their construction. They were small, difficult to maneuver at times, and now proved to be a hugely unpopular mode of transport. The time of the British Canal appeared to be well and truly up. Yet as the haulage side of canals sagged lower than it had ever been, its saviour came in the form of leisure excursions. Sitting beside a canal in Middle England these days, perhaps with a frosty ale at hand, you'd be surprised by how many canal boats are still inching their way along these waterways. The 1960s may have been the death sentence for haulage on the canals, but it coincided perfectly with the uptick in those who liked nothing more than cruising sedately in canal boats along canals that hadn't been touched since the early 19th century and thus retained plenty of charm. The collapse of the haulage industry nearly caused many canals to close, but a combination of volunteer action and sometimes the need to keep canals open to provide drainage meant that they still hung on in the early years. Since then, canals have come roaring back into fashion, with many organizations now set up to maintain them. They now provide that wonderful, old-fashioned method of getting around. Need to travel the 136 miles along the longest canal in Britain, the Grand Union from London to Birmingham? No problem. It'll only take you around 74 hours, but it is a charming cruise, and much nicer than the slog on the grim M1. Britain's canals also provide better access to cities than almost any other country, and you can still cruise through central London and other major cities. 
As I mentioned at the start of this video, the system now includes 6,400 kilometers, that's 4,000 miles worth of canals, 1,569 locks, 53 tunnels, 3,112 bridges, 370 aqueducts, and 74 reservoirs. Today, the canal system in Britain is a much-loved, slightly nostalgic icon of a bygone era. The idea of its use for manufacturing and goods transportation would be ludicrous in modern times, but it has transformed itself into something quite different. These waterways may have been vital in shaping Britain during the Industrial Revolution, when barges loaded with coal would amble up and down the canals, but they've now experienced a glorious regeneration as they hit their retirement age. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do remember to smash that like button below. Check out Magic Spoon Serial as well. It's really fantastic stuff. There's a special link below. And thank you for watching.